The Zeitgeist Movement The Promotion of a Resource-Based Economy Mission Statement, FAQ and Model Our Mission Statement Founded in 2008, the Zeitgeist Movement is a sustainability advocacy organisation which conducts community-based activism and awareness actions through a network of global slash regional chapters, project teams, annual events media and charity work. The movement's principal focus includes the recognition that the majority of the social problems which plague the human species at this time are not the result of some institutional corruption, scarcity, a political policy, a flaw of human nature or other commonly held assumptions of causality in the activist community. Rather the movement recognises that issues such as poverty, corruption, collapse, homelessness, war, starvation and the like appear to be symptoms born out of an outdated social structure. While intermediate reform steps and temporal community support are of interest to the movement, the defining goal here is the installation of a new socio-economic model based upon technically responsible resource management, allocation and distribution through what would be considered the scientific method of reasoning problems and finding optimised solutions this resource-based economic model is about taking a direct, technical approach to social management as opposed to a monetary or even a political one. It is about updating the workings of society to the most advanced and proven method science has to offer, leaving behind the damaging consequences and limiting inhibitions which are generated by our current system of monetary exchange, profits, corporations and other structural and motivational components. The movement is loyal to a train of thought, not figures or institutions. In other words, the view held is that through the use of socially targeted research and tested understandings in science and technology, we are now able to logically arrive at societal applications which could be profoundly more effective in meeting the needs of the human population. In fact, so much so that there is little reason to assume war, poverty, 95% of most crime and many other monetary 90, 95% of most crime and many other money-based scarcity effects common in our current model cannot be resolved over time. The range of the movement's activism and awareness campaigns, the long-term view, which is the transition into a resource-based economic model, is a constant pursuit and expression, as stated before. However, in the path to get there, the movement also recognises the need for transitional reform techniques along with direct community support. For instance, while monetary reform itself is not an end solution proposed by the movement, the merit of such legislative approaches are still considered valid in the context of transition and temporal integrity. Likewise, while food and clove drives and other supportive projects to help those in need today is also not considered a long-term solution. It is still also considered valid in the context of helping others in a time of need, while also drawing awareness of the principal goal. The Zeitgeist Movement has no allegiance to a country or traditional political platforms. It views the world as a single system and the human species as a single family, and recognises that all countries must disarm and learn to share resources and ideas if we expect to survive in the long run. Hence, the solutions arrived at and promoted are in the interest to help everyone on the planet Earth, not a select group. Frequently Asked Questions What is the basic structure of the movement? The movement. The movement's structure is comprised of volunteers creating a global communications network for activism that is focused on the educational imperatives of a new socio-economic model referred to as a natural law resource-based economy. A more formal affiliation is attained by an individual's involvement in the movement via official chapters, 
usually comprised of city, state or national level groups. While the movement is global, chapters are what comprise the local, on the ground presence of the Zeitgeist movement in their respective community or region. Member. The term member generally refers to a person that is active in an official TZM chapter or otherwise supports the movement at large. If a chapter does not exist in your respective region, you may wish to start one. Contact us and let us know. Advocate. Many people support the movement through personal, self-directed activities, whether it be through media content creation, public speaking, charity work, social media and more. There are many ways an individual may engage in their own personal actions without the need for formal chapter affiliation. How does TZM view our major social problems today? TZM is different from most activist communities and political slash social movements. In the world today, due to the way we view the majority of the social problems and their causes, we see it as structural. In short, the socio-economic system itself is regarded as the root cause of persistent negative societal outcomes with human behavior and its resulting effects. Corruption, pollution, wars, waste, exploitation, and hence distortion of values and psychology seen as symptoms of this fundamental root source. Which current issues does the movement focus on? General observations. In the view of the movement, the society today has become increasingly detached from the physical world with techniques of production, distribution, and social ordering that have little to no relationship to the environment or the current state of scientific knowledge with respect to public health and sustainability. Cyclical consumption. For instance, our use of a profit-based, growth-driven monetary system has become one of the greatest destroyers of the natural world and sustainable human values. The entire global economy requires cyclical consumption to operate which means that money must constantly be circulating. Thus, new goods and services must be constantly introduced regardless of the state of the environment and actual human necessity. This perpetual approach has a fatal flaw, for resources as we know it are simply not infinite. Resources are finite, and the Earth is essentially a closed system. To assume the need for constant consumption to keep people employed and hence the market system going, is ecocidal on a finite planet. The true goal of an economy, by definition, is to strategically preserve and create efficiency. The system today demands the opposite. Infinite growth. The monetary market model is based upon money being treated as a commodity and its origination from debt sold for interest income. This is a Ponzi scheme. Each time this commodity, money, is sold, bank loans, it needs to be paid back, debt, with more money charged as a fee for profit, interest. The problem is that the interest value required to settle the debt does not exist in the money supply outright. In other words, bankruptcy and default are not byproducts, they are inevitable, and there is always more debt outstanding than money in existence. This creates a severe offset monetary scarcity that oppresses many people on many levels. The value of scarcity. Likewise, the intents inherent within the monetary system derive a strategic edge from scarcity. This means that depleted resources are actually a positive thing for industry in the short term, for more money can be made of each respective unit. This is contextual to the monetary law of supply and demand, and hence value in economics. It creates a perverse reinforcement to ignore environmental problems and the negative consequences that create scarcity, not to mention reinforcing technically unnecessary human deprivation. This system does not slash cannot meet the needs of many because it isn't financially efficient to do so. Problem slash inefficiency equals profit. Similarly, the system also requires problems slash constant consumer interests in order to work. The more people who have cancer or cars that break down, the better the economy, due to the servicing of those problems. Needless to say, it also generates an inherent disregard for human well-being and the environment. Sustainability, efficiency and preservation are the enemies of this model. Cost efficiency 
and irresponsible obsolescence. There is also the cost efficiency mechanism that demands cutting expenses to remain competitive in the marketplace. Every single product created by a corporation today is immediately inferior by design. For the market requirement to cut creation costs in favour of lowering the output purchase price to maintain a competitive edge automatically reduces the quality of any given item by default. It is impossible to create the strategically best, long-lasting anything in our society, which translates into outrageous amounts of wasted resources and time. Likewise, this same mechanism is reinforcing the environmental disregard, depletion and pollution that we see as a constant in the world today, among other issues. Waste and oppression of the human resource. As far as occupations today, we need to ask ourselves what the point is of a given focus and why it is necessary. The fact is, most jobs today are not directly related to the actual necessities of life. Rather, most are artificial concoctions created in order to keep people employed so they can maintain purchasing power in an environment where our technology continues to expand exponentially, displacing humans from the production force. It is a common statement in politics today to hear about creating jobs. Well, in theory, an occupation could be created where people are paid to sit in a room and test chewing gum all day, every day. But is that a viable use of the human mind? Should we relegate our mental capacity to any so-called job due to mere economic reasons, regardless of what it actually contributes to personal and or social development? This becomes even more bizarre as a train of reason when we realise that mechanisation not only frees us from labour, but it is actually more efficient and productive due to the exponential advancement of science and technology. On a different level, the very reality that each human being is required to be put in a position of servitude to a corporation or client in order to gain income to purchase the necessities of life not only perpetuates the waste of the human mind and human life, it is also a form of oppression, slavery. If we combine the aforementioned infinite growth point above regarding the debt pressure that is built into this system, we see that the combination of the guaranteed debt imbalance and the requirement to submit to labour, regardless of its purpose slash effect, in order to gain monetary income to survival, is a structural form of oppression against the lower classes, who hold most of the debt and need for more periodic income. As noted, advancements in science and technology have shown that we can automate a great deal. The more we have applied mechanisation to labour, the more productive things have become. Therefore, it is not only negligent for us to waste our lives waiting tables, working at a bus station, fixing cars, or other repetitive, monotonous jobs, it is also entirely irresponsible for us not to apply modern mechanisation techniques to, to all industries where it is possible. For apart from strategic resource management, this is a powerful way to achieve balance and abundance for all the world's people thus reducing crime, generating imbalances. The fact is, the market system cannot maintain itself with any viable integrity anymore, for corporations will continue to save money through automation displacing human labour, which also displaces purchasing power, continuing the inevitable loss of growth that defines this system. In the end, Today's society now has access to highly advanced technologies that can easily provide more than enough for all the Earth's people. This is possible through the implementation of an economy based on scientific resource management and applying modern methods. This is the purpose of the Zeitgeist Movement, to create a global awareness to thus transition into a new sustainable direction for humanity as a whole. How does TZM view the solutions to our major social problems today? It appears that most solutions offered in the world today are framed within the current social order of monetary practice. For example, there are over 1 billion people starving in the world tend to utilise money in some fashion to enable the resources needed. TZM takes a very different view. Rather than take each problem on a per case basis and work to solve that problem within the confines of the customarily accepted system, 
a system that might, in fact, be creating the problem itself, TZM steps back to consider the inherent logic of the issues themselves and how they relate to the emerging scientific benchmark with respect to the scientific method, which tends to go outside of social tradition and custom. In the case of 1 billion people starving, the solution does not rest with the need for more donations, more governmental subsidies, or even legislation to limit possible causal abuse and exploitation of such regions, as those are not direct solutions since they do not relate to the mechanics of survival. Rather, they relate and intermediate with the current social customs. The real issue, and hence logic, is technical, not political or financial. Starvation is a technical problem. When clean, life-supporting resources are not made available to a certain region for some reason, the question is then asked, is there an empirical, environmental restriction which is making those resources unavailable? The answer today is clearly no. It is well noted by the WHO and others that there is plenty of food being produced in the world to feed everyone. And we also have clear technical means to also desalinate and clean polluted water to make it safe for drinking. This can be done on an industrial scale. The financial approach clearly has an inherent flaw which is not enabling these basic life supporting attributes and resources to be made available to one billion people. It is economically inefficient when considering the true sense of the definition of economics. The technical approach, which proves that these things are indeed possible, when no one would ever have to starve, says, if it is possible to do it, then we need to simply figure out a new way to do it and bypass the current social custom if need be. As is common within much of the Zeitgeist Movement materials, we see the financial structure as a whole as being a foundational cause of most of the world's issues, with the technical reality of what is possible as an approach to the solution. It is based upon scientific causality, not financial causality. In a world of extreme advancement in information and mechanical technology, the great realisation is that we can do much more than ever to meet the needs of the human population. Along with generating a logic where most of the environmental and social issues we face today could be gone tomorrow, if we simply applied our updated understandings now. How is the Zeitgeist Movement organised? While you may find lecturers, chapter coordinators and other notable members in TZM, all participation is voluntary, with supporters and advocates acting independently as individuals while adhering to a simple set of guidelines. The intention is to create an equally advanced level of understanding within each community so that TZM advocates can take strides on their own. The chapter structure is viewed as holographic, meaning that the integrity and understanding of each regional group mirrors that of the other. In the view of the movement, there is nothing more powerful than a group of people who share an idea and can each logically deduce in tandem a sympathetic method of conduct worldwide. Who funds the Zeitgeist Movement? Chapters operate on a volunteer basis. Most of the time, it is the members themselves that donate personal resources or financial help on a per-project basis to accomplish activism or cover the cost of materials, etc. As of 2016, an all-volunteer, non-profit, 501c3, was founded in California, USA, to help with higher ongoing costs on a global level, such as website infrastructure, printed materials, and costs associated with global event days such as Z-Day. What is Zeitgeist Day? Zeitgeist Day, or Z-Day for short, is a global annual event day which occurs in the middle of March each year. The goal is to increase public awareness of the Zeitgeist movement. The first official Z-Day took place in 2009. These events were well documented by news agencies across the world, including the New York Times in America. An archive list of those events can be found on the zdayglobal.org site. The 2010 Z-Day had 330 sympathetic events occur in over 70 countries worldwide. These events were also well documented by news agencies across the world, including the Huffington Post in America. A Zeitgeist Day event can take on many forms, ranging from a simple showing of DVD media 
to full lectures or interactive question and answer events with chapter organisers in various regions. What is the Zeitgeist Media Festival? Recognising the power of art and media to help change the world, the Zeitgeist Media Festival is an annual worldwide arts festival that occurs late each summer. The idea is to engage in the artistic community and their power to change values. It proposes that needed changes in the structural slash economic workings of society can only manifest in tandem with a personal slash social transformation of values in each of us. While intellectual knowledge serves its role of showing the path, many in the world follow their feelings, not knowledge. The Zeitgeist Media Festival works to bridge those levels while also illuminating a focus where improving the world is no longer considered a fringe or even dangerous pursuit, but rather the highest and most honourable level of personal slash social integrity we have. The Zeitgeist Media Festival also globally works with local food drives to directly help the many homeless and suffering. Is the Zeitgeist Movement related to Peter Joseph's film series? No, the Zeitgeist documentary series was the inspiration for the Zeitgeist Movement due to their popularity and overall message of seeking truth, peace and sustainability in society. While the word Zeitgeist is associated with Peter Joseph's film series, Zeitgeist the Movie, Zeitgeist Addendum and Zeitgeist Moving Forward, these films are personal artistic expressions of the filmmaker himself with the call to found a global movement at the end of the documentary Zeitgeist Addendum. The term Zeitgeist can be defined as the general intellectual, moral and cultural climate of an era. The term movement implies motion and change. Therefore the Zeitgeist movement can be seen as a social movement that urges change in the dominant intellectual, moral and cultural climate of the time. How do I learn about TZM in detail? Aside from numerous global lectures that can be found online and via our YouTube channel, there is a 320 page book, TZM Defined, available for free in PDF form on this site that is the most in-depth written work regarding the movement's train of thought. This work is also being sold at cost in paperback form via Amazon. How to connect to TZM's online voice chat, TeamSpeak. The Zeitgeist Movement has a TeamSpeak server organised with many chat rooms to enable group conferences for the whole movement. Please download and install the software TeamSpeak and then log in with these details in the connection window. Server, voice.thezeitgeistmovement.com, password, TS underscore 129 TZM. Rules of conduct, structure and server policy available here. To get a channel for your national chapter, team or international project, please email tsadmin at thezeitgeistmovement.com. After you have done that, your application will be reviewed for integrity and you'll receive an email with further instructions. About the Natural Law Resource-Based Economy, NLRBE. What are some of the central characteristics of the solution proposed? Automation of labour. As the trend of what appears to be an exponential increase in the evolution of information technology, robotics and computerization continues, it is apparent that human labour is becoming more and more inefficient in regard to meeting the demands necessary for supporting the global population. From the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we have seen an increasing trend toward technological unemployment, which is the phenomenon where humans are replaced by machines in the workforce. This trend, while debatable in regard to its ultimate long-term effect on employment, creates a propensity to displace the worker and hence the consumer slowing consumption. That stated, this issue is actually overshadowed by a social imperative that the use of machine labour mechanisation is provably more efficient than human performance in virtually all sectors. For example, if one was to track the performance output of factory production for example, if one was to track the performance output of factory production within the US steel industry for the past 200 years, we find that not only do less than 5% of the workforce now work in such factories, the efficiency and output capacities have increased substantially. The trend, in fact, now shows that employment is inverse to productivity. The more mechanization occurs, the more productive 
an industry becomes. Today, there are repetitive occupations which simply do not need to exist given the state of automation and computerization cybernation. Not only would mechanization in these areas reduce the mundane burden and allow more free time for people, it would also more importantly increase productivity. Machines do not need breaks, vacations, sleep, etc. The use of mechanization on its own. The use of mechanization on its own means to create many forms of abundance on this planet, from food to physical goods. However, to do this, the traditional labor system we have simply cannot exist. The reality is that our labor for income system is stifling progress in its requirement to keep people working for the sake of economic stability. We are reaching a stage where the efficiency of automation is overriding and making obsolete the system of labor for income. This trend shows no sign of slowing, especially in regard to the now dominant service industry, which is increasingly being automated in the form of kiosks, robotics, and other forms. Likewise, due to the phenomena related in Moore's law and the growing in expense of computers and machines, it is likely that it is simply a matter of time before corporations simply can no longer rationalize keeping human labor anymore, as the automation systems will become too cheap. Of course, this is a paradoxical market phenomenon called by some theorists as the contradiction of capitalism, for it is in effect removing the consumer, laborer, itself, and hence reducing consumption. Apart from those issues, it is also important to consider human labor contributions based on social relevance, not monetary gain. In an RBE, there would be no reason to have occupations such as banking, trading, insurance, cashiers, brokers, advertising, or anything related to the governance of money. All human actions in the form of institutionalized labor should also have the highest social return. There is no logic in wasting resources, time, and energy on operations that do not have a direct and tangible function. This adjustment alone would remove millions of jobs for the idea of working for money as a purpose would no longer exist. In turn, all the poor demographic, shoddy goods, vanity items, and culturally contrived creations designed to influence people for reasons of status, for the sole sake of profit, would also no longer exist, saving countless amounts of time and resources. One final note on this issue. Some hear this and they assume that this voids the communicative arts and personal and social expression as far as painting, sculpture, music and the like. No, these mediums of expression will likely thrive like never before, for the amount of free time made available to people will permit a renaissance of creativity and invention, along with community and social capital. The elimination of the burden of labor obligation will also reduce stress and create a more amiable culture. There is a difference between creating for the sake of keeping society sustainable and efficient, focusing on resource preservation, product efficiency, and strategic allocation of labor for those things which generate a tangible social return versus creating for personal expression, exploration, experimentation, and hence art, which has been a staple of human evolution since the dawn of time. Access over property. The concept of property, unannounced to most today, is a fairly new concept. Before the Neolithic Revolution, as extrapolated from current hunter and gatherer societies existing today, property relationships did not exist as we know them. Neither did money or even trade in many cases. Communities existed in an egalitarian fashion, living within the carrying capacity of their regions and the natural production built in. It was only after direct agricultural development was discovered, eventually proceeding with resource acquisition by ship traders and the like, up to modern day power establishments and corporations, that property became a highly defined staple of this society as we know it today. With that understood, which dismisses the common notion that property is a result of some kind of empirical human nature, the notion of no property is also today often blindly associated with communism and the works of Karl Marx. It is important to point out 
that TZM's advocation of no property is derived from logical inference based almost explicitly upon strategic resource management and efficiency, rather than any surface influence by these supposed communist ideals. There is no relation between the two, for communism was not derived from the need to preserve and manage resources efficiently. Communism in theory and practice was based on a social slash moral relativism, which was culturally specific, not environmentally specific, which is the case with an RBE. The real issue relevant to meeting human needs is not ownership, it is access. People use things, they do not own them. Ownership is a non-operational, protectionist advent, derived from generations of scarcity over resources, currently compounded by market-based advertising, which supports status slash class division for the sake of monetary gain. To put it another way, ownership is a form of controlled restriction, both physically and ideologically. Property as a system of controlled restriction, coupled with the monetary value inherent and hence the market consequences, is unsustainable, limiting and impractical. In an NL slash RBE model, the focus moves from static ownership to strategic access, with a system designed for society to obtain access as needed. For example, rather than owning various forms of recreational sporting equipment, access centres are set up, typically in regions where such actions occur, where a person simply checks out the equipment, uses it for as long as they want, and then returns it. This library type arrangement can be applied to virtually any type of human need. Of course, those reading this who have been conditioned into a more individualistic, materialistic mindset often object with such claims as, what if I want green, custom golf clubs, but only white ones are available? This is a culturally contrived, biased reservation. The issue in question is utility, not vanity. Human expression has been moulded by the needs of the current market-based system, consumption, into values which are simply non-functional and irrelevant. Yes, this would require a value adjustment to quality rather than identity. The fact is, even for those who object from the standpoint of their interest in personal identity, the overarching social ramifications of such a social approach will create benefits that will greatly overshadow any such arbitrary personal preference, creating new values to replace the outdated ones. These include A. No property crime. In a world of access rather than ownership and without money, there is no incentive to steal for there is no resale value. You cannot steal something that no one owns and you certainly couldn't sell it. B. Access abundance. It has been denoted that the average automobile sits in parking spaces for the majority of its lifespan, wasting space and time. Rather than having this wasteful consequence of the ownership system, one car could facilitate a large number of users in a given region, with only a fraction of the production slash resources needed. C. Peak efficiency of production. Unlike today, where the market system must perpetuate inherently inferior products for the sake of economic turnover, we could actually design goods to last, using the best materials and processes strategically available. We no longer make cheap products to serve a poor demographic, which is the majority. This attribute alone will save cataclysmic amounts of resources, while also enabling a society to have access to goods and services that they would never have had in a world based on money, inherent obsolescence, and property. Self-contained slash localized city and production systems. There are many brilliant engineers who have worked to tackle the issue of industrial design, from Jacques Fresco to Arbuckminster Fuller to Nikola Tesla. Behind such designs, such as Jacques Fresco's famed circular cities, or Fuller's geodistic domes, rests a basic train of thought, strategic efficiency, and maximization of productivity. For example, Fresco's circular city is constructed of a series of belts, each serving a social function, such as energy production, research, recreation, living, etc. Hence, each city is a system where all needs are produced within the city complex in a localized fashion whenever possible. 
For example, renewable energy generation occurs near the outer perimeter. Food production is produced closer to the middle within industrial sized greenhouses. This is very different in its logic from the globalization based economy we live in today, which wastes outrageous amounts of energy and resources due to unneeded transport and labor processing. Likewise, transportation within the circular cities is strategically created to eliminate the use of detached automobiles, except for rare cases such as emergency vehicles. Homes are created to be microsystems as well, with much power generation occurring internally, such as from sunlight absorbed by the building's structure using photovoltaic technology. More information on these city systems can be found at thevenusproject.com. The geodistic dome, perfected by Buckminster Fuller, offers another efficiency oriented medium within a similar train of thought. Fuller's goal was to build designs to do more with fewer resources. He noticed problems inherent in conventional construction techniques and recognized the indigenous strength of naturally occurring structures. The advantages include a much stronger structure than a conventional building while using less material to construct. Domes can be built very quickly because they are of a modular prefab construction and soup being mass produced. They also use less energy to keep warm slash cool than a conventional box structure. More information can be found at BFI.org. In the end, the fundamental interest is, again, sustainability and efficiency on all levels, from the housing design to the earth design. The market system actually fights this efficiency due to the broken, competitive nature inherent. Technological unification of Earth via systems approach. We live in a symbiotic slash synergistic planetary ecosystem with a cause effect balance reflecting a single system of earthly operation. Buckminster Fuller defined this well when he referred to the planet as spaceship Earth. It is time we reflect this natural state of affairs in our societal affairs on this planet. The fact of the matter is that human societies, which are dispersed across the globe, require resources which are also ununiformly dispersed across the globe. Our current procedure for enabling resource distribution comes in the form of corporations which seek and claim ownership of our earthly resources, which they in turn sell to others in the name of profit. The problems inherent in this practice are numerous, again due to the self-interest based disposition inherent in selling anything for personal gain as denoted above. But in the larger scheme of things, this is only a partial issue when it comes to the reality that we live on a finite planet and where resource management and preservation should be the number one concern in regard to human survival, especially with the population explosion of the last 200 years. Two people are born every second on this planet, and each one of those humans needs a lifetime of food, energy, water, and the like. Given this fundamental need to understand what we have, the rates of depletion, and invariably, the need to streamline industry in the most efficient, productive way, a global system of resource management must be put in place. It is just common sense. This is an extensive subject when one considers the technical, quantitative variables needed for implementation. However, for the sake of overview, it can be stated that the first step is a full global survey of all earthly resources. Then, based on a quantitative analysis of the properties of each material, a strategically defined process of production is constructed from the bottom up, using such variables as negative retroactions, renewability, etc. More on this can be found in the section called Project Earth in the ZM lecture called Where Are We Going? Then consumption statistics are accessed, rates of depletion become monitored, distribution is logically formulated, etc. In other words, it is a full systems approach to earthly resource management, production, and distribution with the goal of absolute efficiency, conservation, and sustainability. Given the mathematically defined attributes as based on all information at the time, along with the state of technology at the time, the parameters for social operation within the industrial complex become self-evident, with decisions arrived at by way of computation, not human opinion. 
This is where computer intelligence becomes an important tool for social governance. For only the computation ability slash programming of computers can access and strategically regulate such processes efficiently and in real time. This technological application is not novel. It is simply scaled out from current methods already known. The scientific method as the methodology for governance. The application of the scientific method for social concern is an oft-repeated mantra for the basis of the social operation in a resource-based economy model. While the obviousness of this in regard to industry is simple enough to understand, it is important to also realize its value in regard to human behavior. Science, historically speaking, has often been derailed as a cold, restrictive discipline, reserved for the sake of mere technology and invention. Little regard seems to be currently given to its use in the understanding of human behavior. Superstitious thought, which has been powerfully dominant in human evolution, has worked on the basis that the human being was somehow detached from the physical world. We have souls, spirits, we are divine, we are related slash guided by an all-seeing, all-knowing, controlling God, etc. Conversely, yet oddly similar, there is an argument that humans have free will in their decisions and that we have an open ability to choose our actions, absent of the influence of our environment or even education. Now, while the vastness of the prior two statements, and many reading, those who could find numerous cultural arguments to claim the contrary, this doesn't change the basic reality that we humans have historically liked to think that we are special and unique from the rest of the organisms and natural phenomena around us. However, as time has gone on, it has become increasingly obvious that we are not special and that there is no such thing as special in the natural world. For everything is special based on the uniqueness of all organisms. There is no reason to assume the human being is any more important or intrinsically different or special than a mole, a tree, an ant, a leaf, or a cancer cell. This isn't new age rhetoric. It is fundamental logic. We are physical phenomena, nothing more or less. We are greatly influenced by our culture and our values and behaviours can only mostly be a result of our conditioning, as external phenomena interacts with our genetic predispositions. For example, we have a notion called talent, which is another word for a genetic predisposition to a given behaviour or set of behaviours. A piano prodigy might have an inherent ability that enables them to learn more quickly and perform in a more acute way than another who has spent the same time in practice but doesn't have the genetic predisposition. Be that as it may, that talented person still had to learn what a piano was and how to play it. In other words, genes are not autonomous indicators of commands. It takes an environmental trigger to allow the propensity to materialize. At any rate, it is not the point of this article to expand on the argument of nature and nurture. The point is that we have proven to be scientifically defined and a product of traceable causality. And it is this understanding that can allow us to slow and even stop the aberrant or criminal behavior we see in society today, such as abuse, murder, theft, and the like. The logic, once the effects of human conditioning are understood, is to remove the environmental attributes which are enabling the reactions. Just as an abused dog who has been starved for a week might have a knee-jerk reaction to react very violently to an otherwise innocuous passerby, we humans have the same behavior dynamic. If you don't want people to steal food, do not deprive them of it. It has been found that prisons are now generating, are now generating more violence than they are curbing. If you teach a child to be a hateful racist, then he will carry on those values into the rest of his life very often. Human values and hence human behavior are shaped by the environment in a cause and effect based way, no different than a leaf being blown by the wind. In a resource based economic model, the central focus in regard to removing aberrant human actions is not to punish them, but to find the reasons for their offensive actions and work to eliminate them. Humans are products of their environment and personal slash social reform is a scientific process. Moving away from money and markets. Market theory assumes a number of things, which have proven to be either false, marginally beneficial, or outright socially detrimental. The core problems to consider are the following. A. 
the need for infinite growth, which is mathematically unsustainable and ecologically detrimental. The basis of the market system is not the intelligent management of our mostly finite resources on this planet, but rather the perpetual but rather the perpetual extraction and consumption of them for the sake of profit and economic growth. In order to keep people employed, people must constantly consume, regardless of the state of affairs within the environment and often regardless of product utility. This is the absolute reverse of what a sustainable practice would require, which is the strategic preservation and efficient use of resources. B. A corruption generating incentive system. It is often said that the competitive marketplace creates the incentive to act for the sake of social progress. While this is partially true, it also generates an unequal, if not more profound amount of corruption in the form of planned obsolescence, common crime, wars, large-scale financial fraud, labor exploitation, and many other issues. The vast majority of people in prison today are there because of monetary-related crime or non-violent drug offenses. The majority of legislation exists in the context of monetary-based crimes. Also, if one was to critically examine history and peer into the documented biographies slash mentalities of the greatest scientists and inventors of our time, such as N. Tesla, A. Einstein, A. Bell, the Wright brothers, and many others, it is found that they did not find their motivation in the prospect of monetary gain. The interest to make money must not be confused with the interest to create socially beneficial products, and very often they are even at odds. C. A disjunct, inefficient, industrial complex which wastes tremendous amounts of resources and energy. In the world today, with the advent of globalization, it has become more profitable to import and export both labour and goods across the globe, rather than to produce locally. We import bananas from Ecuador to the US and bottled water from Fuji, Japan, while Western companies will go to the deprived third world to exploit cheap labour, etc. Likewise, the process of extraction to component generation to assembly to distribution of a given good might cross through multiple countries for a single final product, simply due to labour and production costs slash property costs. This cost efficiency generates extreme technical inefficiency and is only justifiable within the market system for the sake of saving money. In a resource-based economy model, the focus is maximum technical efficiency. The production process is not dispersed, but made as centralized and fluid as possible, with elements moving the very least amount, saving what would be tremendous amounts of energy and labor as compared to methods today. Food is grown locally whenever possible, which is most of the time, given the flexibility of indoor agriculture technology today, while all extraction, production, and distribution is logically organized to use as little labor slash transport slash space as possible, while producing the strategically best possible goods. See more below. In other words, the system is planned to maximize efficiency and minimize waste. D. A propensity for establishments. Very simply, established corporate slash financial orders have a built-in tendency to stop new, socially positive advents from coming to fruition if there is a foreshadowed loss of market share, profit, and hence power. It is important to consider the basic nature of a corporation and its inherent need for self-perpetuation. If a person starts a company, hires employees, creates a market, and becomes profitable, what has thus been created, in part, is the means for survival for a group of people, since each person in that group typically becomes dependent on that organization for income. A natural, protectionist propensity is created, whereas anything that threatens the institution thus threatens the well-being of the group slash individual. This is the fabric of a competition mindset. While people think of free market competition as a battle between two or more companies in a given industry, they often miss the other level, the competition against new advents, which would make them obsolete outright. The best way to expand on this point is to simply give an example, such as the US government and big oil collusion to limit the expansion of the fully electric car, EV, in the US. This issue was well presented and sourced in the documentary called Who Killed the Electric Car? The bottom line here 
is that the need to preserve an established order for the sake of the well-being on those on the payroll leads to an inherent tendency to stifle progress. A new technology which can make prior technology obsolete will be met with resistance unless there is a way for the market system to absorb it in a slow fashion, allowing for a transition for the corporations, i.e. the perpetuation of hybrid cars in the US, as opposed to the fully electric ones which could exist now in abundance. There is also a large amount of evidence that the FDA has engaged in favoritism slash collusion with pharmaceutical companies to limit slash stop the availability of advanced progressive drugs which would void existing slash profitable ones. In a resource-based economy, there is nothing to hold back development slash implementation of anything. If safe and useful, it would immediately be implemented into society with no monetary institution to thwart the change due to their self-preserving monetary nature. E. An inherent obsolescence which creates inferior products immediately due to the need to stay competitive. This little recognized attribute of production is another example of the waste which is created in the market system. It is bad enough that multiple companies constantly duplicate each other's items in an attempt to make their variations more interesting for the sake of public consumption, but a more wasteful reality is that due to the competitive basis of the system, it is a mathematical certainty that every good produced is immediately inferior the moment it is created, due to the need to cut the initial cost basis of production and hence stay competitive against another company, which is doing the exact same thing for the same reason. The old free market adage where producers create the best possible goods at the lowest possible prices is a needlessly wasteful fantasy and detrimentally misleading, for it is impossible for a company to use the most efficient material or processes in the production of anything, as it would be too expensive to maintain a competitive cost basis. They very simply cannot make the strategically best physically. It is mathematically impossible. If they did, no one would buy it. For it would be unaffordable due to the values inherent in the high quality materials and methods. Remember, people buy what they can afford to. Every person on this planet has a built-in limit of affordability in the monetary system. So, this generates a feedback loop of constant waste via inferior production to meet inferior demand. In a resource-based economic model, goods are created to last. With the expansion and updating of certain goods, built directly into their design, and with recycling strategically accessed as well, limiting waste. You will notice the term strategically best was used in the statement above. This qualification means that goods are created with respect to the state of affairs of planetary resources, with the quality of materials used based on an equation taking into account all relevant attributes, rates of depletion, negative retroactions, and the like. In other words, we would not blindly use titanium for, say, every single computer enclosure made just because it might be the strongest materials for the job. That narrow practice could lead to depletion. Rather, there would be a gradient of material quality which would be accessed through analysis of relevant attributes, such as comparable resources, rates of natural obsolescence for a given item, statistical usage in the community, etc. These properties and relationships could be accessed through programming with the most strategically viable solution computed and output in real time. It is a mere issue of calculation. F. A propensity for monopoly and cartel due to the basic motivation of growth and increased market share. This is a point that economic theorists will often deny under the assumption that open competition is self-regulating and that monopolies and cartels are extremely rare anomalies in a free market system. This invisible hand assumption holds little validity historically, not to mention the outstanding legislation around this issue which proves its infeasibility. In America, there have been numerous monopolies, such as Standard Oil and Microsoft. Cartels, which are essentially monopolies by way of collusion between the largest competitors in an industry, are also present to this day, although perhaps less obvious to the casual observer. In any case, the free market itself does not resolve these issues. 
It always takes the government to step in and break up the monopolies. The more important point is that in an economy based on growth, it is only natural for a corporation to want to expand and hence dominate. After all, that is the basis of economic stability in the modern world, expansion. Expansion of any corporation always gravitates toward monopoly or cartel, for, again, the basic drive of competition is to outdo your competitor. In other words, monopoly and cartel are absolutely natural in the competitive system. In fact, it is inevitable. For again, the very basis is to seek dominance over market share. The true detriment of this reality goes back to the point above. The inherent propensity for an establishment to preserve its institution. If a medical cartel is influencing the FDA, then new ideas which void that cartel's income sources will often be fought regardless of the social benefits being thwarted. G. The market system is driven, in part, by scarcity. The less there is of something, the more money that can be generated in the short term. This sets up a propensity for corporations to limit availability, and hence deny production abundance. It is simply against the very nature of what drives demand and creates abundance. The Kimberley diamond mines in Africa have been documented in the past to burn diamonds in order to keep prices high. Diamonds are rare resources which take billions of years to create. This is nothing but problematic. The world we live in should be based on the interest to generate an abundance for the world's people along with strategic preservation and streamlined methods to enable that abundance. This is the central reason why, as of 2010, there are over a billion people starving on the planet. It has nothing to do with an inability to produce food, and everything having to do with an inherent need to create slash preserve scarcity for the sake of short-term profits. Abundance, efficiency, and sustainability are, very simply, the enemies of profit. This scarcity logic also applies to the quality of goods. The idea of creating something that could last, say, a lifetime with little repair is an anathema to the market system, for it reduces consumption rates, which slows and creates systemic repercussions, loss of jobs, etc. The scarcity attribute of the market system is nothing but detrimental for these reasons. Not to mention that it doesn't even serve the role of efficient resource preservation, which is also claimed. While supply and demand dictates that the less there is of something, the more it will be valued, and hence the increased value will limit consumption, reducing the possibility of running out, the incentive to create scarcity, coupled with the inherent short-term reward which results from scarcity-driven base prices, nullifies the idea that this enables strategic preservation. We will likely never run out of oil in the current market system. Rather, the prices will become so high that no one can afford it, while those corporations who own the remaining oil will make a great deal of money off of the scarcity, regardless of the long-term social ramifications. In other words, remaining scarce resources existing in such high economic value that it limits their consumption is not to be confused with preservation that is functional and strategic. True strategic preservation can only come from the direct management of the resource in question in regard to the most efficient technical applications of the resource in industry itself, not arbitrary service price relationships absent of rational allocation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I'm only a child, yet I know we are all in this together and should act as one single world towards one single goal. We have heard the rationales offered by the superpowers. We know who speaks for the nations, but who speaks for the human species? Who speaks for Earth? I am talking about the resource-based economy. The scientific method for social equality Where our technology allows for life in global abundance And the choice between contender and incumbent is redundant 
Welcome to this pale blue dot in our galaxy Where we fear the finality of our own mortality And we worry about our salary and consumption of calories While famine and war have caused another fatality We live in a finite world, but our need for growth is infinite Our relationship with money is so damn intimate We can't slow down, we want more, oh we're so into it Intimate? It would be a sin to quit So now the whole planet's in debt We owe quite a tall stack But it's literally impossible to pay it all back Because money is debt created with interest to listen actually more money owed than exists in the whole system That's a pyramid scheme Not just mean individuals skimming the cream Not just smoke-filled rooms with the supremely powerful convene It seems a systemic flaw is the theme to this meme Today's system defines who wins and loses with competitions And losers are created by definition Our leaders are ruled by political ambition Not a single one of them is a trained technician It would be insane to listen to their claims I'd rather use the scientific method to arrive at decisions So pardon my sedition, but I stand by my division And I fight against this system with a thought for ammunition It's a train of thought, it's a frame of sorts A campaign where you can't just feign support The train of thought can't be claimed or bought it's an idea, there's no one you can blame in court It's a train of thought, it's not a game or sport It pertains to humane and sustained support Like a chain is wrought, it can be trained and taught To anyone with a brain, let me explain in short I'm talking about the resource-based economy The scientific method for social equality No political borders, no one giving you orders It's a wealth worth giving to our sons and daughters I'm talking about the resource-based economy The scientific method for social equality We can only try to fit the mold So instead of growth and jobs, let's set ourselves a new goal A bold, high standard of living for the planet as a whole In a sustainable way for every human soul, young and old Let go of your borders, time to think worldwide No more democracy and politics, all that's been tried Instead, we use the scientific method as a guide To arrive at decisions on how technology is applied And if we want to provide, we can't take a resource and abuse it We need to keep track of what we have and how fast we use it System theory tells us everything in nature is connected When we cut down to many trees Trees, the ecosystem is affected So in production it makes sense to build everything to last Planned obsolescence should be a thing of the past And if we design fast evolving technologies to be modular We can replace old parts with a new one more popular To distribute our goods, the shortest distance is preferred To transfer from there what we can make here is absurd Then we evaluate demand for goods and build hubs to receive them Like a library where you check things out for as long as you need them All of this is doable with today's technology As long as we apply the right methodology Cause scarcity is technically outdated, you follow me? This way we can live in abundance and global equality. I'm talking about the resource-based economy, the scientific method for social equality. The technology allows a lot of global abundance, and the choice between contender and incumbent is redundant. I'm talking about the resource-based economy, the scientific method for social equality. Every time the transition is about damn time, the planet is shared by all. Incentive is the key to understanding volition We don't act without it, it's behind any decision There's no human nature to behavior, just predisposition It has to be supported by the surrounding conditions So the mission is one we should all agree to pick No police, no prisons, no referee to trick Build a system with no incentive for harmful behavior Cause if you remove the carrot, you don't need the stick There would be nothing to gain from trying to mislead Mistreat or deceive, no incentive to thieve What could you hope to achieve? Anything you need, you can get for free and it would always be available, so no reason for greed. 10% of the population makes the system run, so instead of working 9 to 5, live your life for fun. Travel the world, raise a family, read a book, build something beautifully useful, or learn to cook. It's this generation's defining challenge, extraordinaire. It's not complicated, just a comprehensive affair. For some it's a big mouthful, for others a breath of fresh air. Don't be scared, cause it can be done, don't despair. Educate yourself on how the current system's impaired. But please do more than just make other people aware. When it comes down to it, we have two things to declare. One, we all care, and two, we all share. That train of thought, it's a frame of sorts. A campaign where you can't just fame support. The train of thought can't be claimed or bought. It's an idea, there's no one you can blame in court. It's a train of thought, it's not a game or sport. It pertains to humane and sustained support Like a chain is wrought It can't be trained and taught To anyone with a brain Let me explain in short I'm talking about the resource-based economy the scientific method for social equality No political borders No one giving you orders It's a wealth worth giving to our sons and daughters I'm talking about the resource-based economy the scientific method for social equality Take care of the planet and meet everybody's need Make the wealth that free to stay and let me Redundant. I'm talking about the resource-based economy The scientific 
wish I could say everything's just peachy. Living life is so easy, but it's time. They got everyone believing that's just the way it is. And so there's nothing to be done. We got everything we need to provide for each other. It wouldn't it be nice if no one had to find you just to get a bite to eat? Together we can build. Thank you.